Welcome to the Stanford Crack Course on Practical Machine Learning with Python. Today we're looking at Module 3.2, Explanatory Data Analysis. In this module, we will be walking through a story narrated using visualizations about the U.S. Elections dataset from Kaggle. First, let's look at what variables are available in this dataset. Given that the data used are just a selection made by Kaggle for the purpose of practice, we see a kind of metaphor. We are standing in front of the ocean and our hands only have one glass, no matter what size. Given the disproportionate sizes, this is irrelevant. But we can at least choose an intelligent capable of extracting meaning from seawater, able to select which drops will be collected in the glass. The possibilities of graphical representations are huge, from the maps to collect a selected variable to all kinds of calculations performed in variables like correlations. Now, Kaggle is a source of data sets, uh, Kaggle.com, covering a number of topics from elections to finance to baby names to Irish species. It is also a platform for analyzing the data and interacting with other data science prof professionals. Okay, back to the module. Now, Kaggle is actually a platform which publishes data sets for competitive purposes. These data sets come either in categories like US election data, American Community Survey, World Food Facts, etc or sometimes are posted under more general categories such as machine learning datasets for Python, data science datasets for R, and so on. For the mapping of data, we have considered only uh, the variables with most effect, easy correlation, and easy distinction between boundaries. For example, the population variable is more understandable, easily correlatable to what we want to anal analyze, uh, for example, the voter turnout and can be easily visualized as compared to another variable, like whether the person has stayed in the same house for more than a year. Say we are analyzing the number of people who have voted for a particular candidate from their respective areas. It is easier to plot and correlate with the data plotted from the number of votes or the fraction of votes the candidate has got, rather than some meaningless variable, like the candidate's name. First up, let's look at the U.S. population. The darker shades represent higher populated counties. We can see a clear trend that border states in the east and west coasts are much heavier populated than the central states. Historically, bigger states such as California and Texas, which have large populations, are considered safe states. States with an average population, like Virginia, Ohio, Nevada, and Florida, are considered swing states for this election. Looking at the image, we see the darker areas correspond to areas where more votes have been cast for the winning candidates. The lighter areas show where the winning candidates have gotten less of the majority. To reach this representation of correlations, have followed the following steps. Import data and see what it has values for states so far. The selected states are Iowa, Nevada, South Carolina, and New Hampshire. Create a new data frame, a data structure we can understand as a table. That holds, values, uh, that holds votes by state and a fraction of total votes, Democrat and Republican, that a candidate received and pair them down uh, to only those that are still in the race as of 2nd of March. To force an order at the results, you can add a column with the order the primaries took place to visualize data easier. Next, create a pairwise list of candidates. Calculate the Pearson correlation between each pair and find the maximum min. The higher the correlation, the less the effect ha the candidate has on the other. The lower the correlation, the more of an effect. So states that voted more for Trump voted less for Carson. In this primary campaign, winning over 40% of the vote in the crowded Republican field is a substantially positive result for a candidate. Counties like Hancock and Iowa, or Elko and Nevada, probably show certain characteristics indicative of potential Cruz success. To what extent are counties like Hancock or Elko standouts in terms of Cruz's performance? Let's get some basic descriptive statistics on the board. Contrast Cruz's best performances with his bottom five, which are all in New Hampshire. That occurs in the next slide. The basic measures so far show that Cruz's best performance is a bit more atypical than his worst performance. Now for the interesting part. What characterizes the counties where Cruz has performed best? We will join the Cruz max data with the county fat data. Then we will test the correlation of fraction of the vote with 2014's estimated population. On the left-hand side, 
the y is the fraction votes, and the x is the population. This visualization is really helpful because it reveals a definite outlier in the population that should be removed. If removing the outlier and recalculating the correlation coefficient, um, where the new one is negative 0 0.110, we can see that the outlier was substantially diminishing the correlation. On the right-hand side, we can use the population density as a stand-in for urban versus rural performance, and the new correlation is a coefficient of negative 0 0.191. The preparation of this bar plot has been necessary to add votes per candidate, later to sort in ascending order. Subsequently, selected candidates, um, Hillary Clinton in blue and Donald Trump in green, uh, is there. Uh, on the horizontal, uh, there are abbreviations of the names of the states, and on the vertical are the votes and the fraction of votes for each candidate. Previous work on these six images is to group the data to make sense of a linear regression. And leave it as a background, uh, and leave as a, as background a scatter plot of the data with different colors for each candidate. In the first image, income versus white percentage is used. In the second one, Hispanic percentage versus white percentage is used. In the third image, percentage of female firm owner versus female percentage is used. In the fourth image, turnout, concurrency, uh, and voters against percentage of white population is used. In the fifth picture, it's turnout versus income. And in the last image, percentage of persons not speaking English versus not born in the U.S. The information we knew from these basic explanatory techniques can be used to help us in modeling as we move ahead. First up, from the graphical representations of the data, we understood which states tend to show up to vote more and which states are more likely to vote for winning candidates. Next, we did a simple correlation analysis and picked out outliers from the data. We also looked at raw number of votes per candidate and formed an idea of which candidates are more likely to get more votes. Finally, we tried to understand the characteristics that define each candidate's supporters. This allowed us to look to form an idea for some potential questions to be asked when we carry out modeling. For example, which candidates are high income, white males most likely to vote for? How about middle income Hispanic female, and sorry, Hispanic families? And that concludes our video. This course was created as a part of the Stanford Crowd Course Initiative, the world's first massive online open coursework developed entirely by an online community. If you'd like to learn more about us or view more courses, visit crowdcourse.stanford.edu.